Wow. Praise the Lord. It's an exciting time. Uh, a lot's going on in the world, but nonetheless, God's up to something. God is working on your behalf. God is in charge. And this morning, we've come full circle. We've been uh, reading and we've been enjoying, we've been studying the book of Job. And I am uh, going to bring Job to a, to a final a finale this morning. I do want to uh, draw in a conclusion to what we have been working through. And I hope that, uh, that your impressions of who Job is and what's he all about has, has grown and deepened. And that the Job is not just a title of a book in the Old Testament. But when you think of Job, I want you to think of a flesh and blood individual who somebody that over the last month that you've gotten to know, you've gotten to identify with. And as you begin to identify and understand who Job is, that it will deepen your own faith in, in God and who he is. And so this morning, the title of today's message is Job, a man of faith. And today we are going to draw a conclusion to this sermon series on the life of Job. Job is a man some have called the greatest man of faith in the Bible besides Jesus himself. Surely in the Old Testament no man suffered as much for his relationship with God than Job did. Remember God at the very beginning back in chapter 1 and 2. He described Job as blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Had Job not been blameless, upright and turning away from evil, then the devil, the adversary in chapter 1, wouldn't have had any reason or care or concern to look and focus in his direction. And so in some respects, it was his righteousness that led uh, to be a target of the adversary. And the adversary, we learn in chapter 1 or 2, he turned his focus and he launched an attack on not only Job, but on his loved ones and his wealth and his health. And, and eventually it led him... Uh, left Job alone and, and deathly ill and in suffering and in pain without any explanation. We see the bigger picture. Remember from the very beginning, there was what we call the upper story and the lower story. And as you're reading your Bible, whether it's in the Old or even the New Testament, but especially in these narratives, these stories, we know that there's something that God is doing that's the upper story. It's his big picture, big plan. And then there's the, the lower story. And it doesn't necessarily, the lower story is any less important, not lower necessarily in priority, but there's two things. There's what God is doing, and then there's the, the operations and the activities of man. And that's not... That's never more strikingly clear than in the book of Job. And so as we are outside looking in, we know from chapters 1 and 2 that Job was attacked. That God allowed Satan to have influence and, and to wreak havoc in Job's life. Not just in one occasion, but it happened in chapter 2 a second time. In the first occasion, we know that that the adversary was allowed to take everything but not to touch Job. And so he did just that. He took his wealth. He took his children. He took his family. And then in chapter 2, the adversary returns and God said, Hey, look how righteous Job is. You know, he hasn't cursed God. He hasn't turned away. Well, just let me, let me put my hands on him. Skin for skin, the adversary said. God said, you can lay your hands, but you can't take his life. That's all that the adversary needed. And we know in the story that Job broke out in tremendous suffering. S boils and sores and, 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 and unimaginable suffering that Job was going through. But today, I want to open our eyes to four key aspects of Job's profound faith that he displayed in the midst of extraordinary suffering. His faith carried him through his trial. And when we are living by faith, as Job lived by faith, we too can experience the power of God in our trials. What we learn from Job's faith can carry us through the hard times. Who wants to understand there's four key dimensions, facets of 
Job's faith that as we come to a conclusion in the life of Job, I want to expound on. But if you have your Bibles with you today, I want you to turn to Job chapter 38. And in Job chapter 38, we have God, God speaking. God is talking. Over the last couple of weeks, we know that Job had three friends that showed up to offer comfort and guidance. And, and Job's friends weren't all that comforting and all that didn't offer a whole lot of guidance that was of what God desired for Job's life. And ultimately, his three friends were of the same opinion that somehow Job had some secret sin. He had something awfully wrong with him that he had done to transgress God and that God was punishing him. He was actually sowing what he had somehow reaped, even though he was blameless with man on the outside. At least something was, you know, make get right with God, Job. Get right with God, Job, and, and God will, will offer his, uh, his healing and his forgiveness to you. And, and Job was repeating that, no, there's, there's, you know, that's not what it is. If I have openly sinned, if I have taken, if I have stolen, if I all these things, and, you know, let me know. And even through these trials, there were moments where Job had some, some questions. He had some doubts, some worries. And finally, God speaks up. And in Job chapter 38, I want to read verse 1 through 7. So finally, we don't know how long Job suffered. If you want to take it in chapters, he, he suffered for 37 chapters. So after 37 chapters of suffering... Suffering in silence. Do you understand this? God, he hadn't heard. God hadn't responded. Have you ever had seasons in your life where you're going through a trial and a tr adversity and it's like God was silent? It's like God was nowhere to be found. And you're like, God, I'm here. And you've been taught and you know that God's there, but you don't hear him. And Job's been experiencing this pain, not just the physical pain of his sickness and his suffering, not just the emotional pain of the suffering of the loss of his children. Everything was gone except for his wife. Everything, his children were gone, his health was gone. And in this case, the only reason I can understand that God or Satan, the adversary, did not take Job's wife is at this particular time, Job's wife was saying, well, why don't you just curse God and die? So in this particular moment, the adversary allowed to have, he wanted his voice to be spoken in this particular instance, even through Job's wife, who it was to remind Job that there was no one that he could depend on. And the most and the closest person in his life would be, have been his wife. And even in this case, his wife does not understand. The person on the planet that knew Job the most. Just curse God and die. And you've maybe had seasons in your life or moments where you thought, well, at least I have those closest to me. And, and you didn't. And so there are so many different levels that Job suffered and so many different ways that we can relate to him. And finally, God speaks up in Job chapter 38, verse 1. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins. That's like belting your belt, your belt strap. Like a man. And I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning star sang together? And all the sons of God shouted for joy. 
And for the next two chapters, chapter 38 and chapter 39, and even the next three chapters, chapter 40, God speaks. And let me tell you what, out of these three chapters, I added them up. I stopped. I, didn't, I, didn't re, I, I actually physically counted. God asks Job 61 questions. Sixty-one questions. But what we have here is God showing up in His presence. We have here that God answered Job out of the storm. And His answer was not with, let me give you answers, but it was asking questions. And over the time that this time of suffering, Job had come, there was... He had asked some questions. There were some directs, some thoughts and some ways that weren't quite in alignment to with what God desired for his life. And Job did ask the why questions. God, why is, why is this happening? Why is this? Uh, and if you even look in chapter 40, Job says, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. After these questions, Job cries out, Well, who am I? Let let him who reproves God answer it. In other words, there was times where God, Job was thinking like he was suggesting and telling God how he should be doing things. Well, God, this is how you should be doing this. Have you ever had, have you ever done that in your own life? Now, be honest with yourself. Have you ever had time to say, God, if I was in charge, this is how it'd be done. Or God, you're, you're, you know, this isn't going the way it should be. What's, you know, you need to get busy. You need, you need to do things like this. And we've all had those times that when God manifested his power and his presence to Job's life here at this particular time, there were questions and these questions were ultimately related to things that Job had no answers. Every single question that God asked Job had to do with nature, had to do with him laying the foundations of the world, had to do with things like rain and clouds. Where do these come from? Where does that come from? And he went, the next chapter is about the beasts of the, of that God has created and, the, and their majesty and, and who lays out the framework and how they and what they do and every single question that God asks Job Job has no answer he does not know and ultimately this was a reminder to Job that even though he thought he knew some things there is so much more to the wisdom and the greatness of this world that he knew nothing about that God's wisdom and his understandings and his ways were far superior to anything that Job could offer. And it brought Job to a, a place of repentance that he would have even assumed to give God advice. That he would even hint at somehow God was dropping the ball, not doing what he was supposed to be doing not doing it according to how it should be done. And in Job chapter 40, verse 3, Job says, Jen Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am, in, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken and I will not answer, even twice, and I will add nothing more. Job understood that there were ways of God that were far superior to his own. And now I want to get to really the, the four aspects of Job's faith that we can model, that we can grow from in our own faith with God. First of all, walking by faith or the, the faith that Job exercised exercise it means believing when we don't see it it means believing when we don't see it 
Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It means we believe even when we don't see it. I'm reminded back in Job chapter 10, verse 12, where Job says, You have granted me life and loving kindness. Now think about this now. We know that Job's suffering and sores, all the suffering that we've talked about. But he says, You have granted me life and loving kindness, and your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things have con- you have concealed in your heart. I know that this is within you. Job is declaring, even though he can't see it with his physical eyes, he is declaring the greatness and the loving kindness and the faithfulness of God, even when he can't see it. And the faith that God wants you to grow in and model after the life of Job is that we must walk in faith. We must walk in faith, even when we don't under or we don't see it. The second aspect of the faith of Job is walking in faith means obeying God when we don't understand it. It means believing God number one when we don't see it, but number two, it means obeying God. When we don't understand it. Now that's truly the definition of faith. When you go into turn the ignition switch on your car. You just automatically assume that the car is going to start. It doesn't require much faith in that. But faith. Walking by faith is even though maybe the circumstances in the physical and the natural aren't lining up by faith, you're going to be obedient to God regardless. A clear example of this, I was, this is, I've seen this so many times exercised in my own life, is in the area, it just, it just is. God knows how my heart, He knows my heart. And when it comes to finances, He knows my heart. You've heard me share this. I'll be, I'll be transparent with you. You know, there's, there's times that God lays it on my heart to be a blessing or to be generous, and there's times on my heart I wrestle with that. Can I be anyone else here? Can I get an amen? The heart can be selfish. And when I get a $5 bill in my hand, it kind of wants to stay there. And God knows that if, if that $5 bill owns me, or if I own it, in terms of if I can give it away. If I can't give it away, I don't own it, it owns me. And God knows that if it owns me, then it's going to become a barrier. It's going to be a blockage between what God can truly do and be a blessing in my life. If I can't trust God to give $5 away, then who's to say he's going to bless me with $10? And in the area of finances, when it comes to trusting God, even when you don't understand it. I remember years ago, I went into the pastor. I said, pastor, and this this is exactly how it went down. I look back and I laugh at it, but this is, this is, this is how I was just years ago. And I said, okay, this is my job. This is my pay. I just laid it. I said, here's my paycheck. I get, well, you know, I don't remember. Let's say I get 2000 a year or, or a month, 2000 a month. It wasn't that long ago. I'm not that old. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you know, here are my bills and I laid them out. You know, here's my electric bill. Here's my mortgage. Here's my car payment. Here's my insurance. And here's my dot, 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 dot. And it came out to about 2050. And I said, and now here's my, in my check. I get $2,000 a month. All my bills. I said, I don't, where, where do I, how do I tithe? Where's my tithe in this? And he listened to me like a good pastor. And he was patient with me. And he didn't beat me over the head with a Bible and say, oh, ye of little faith. I was trying to be logical about it. I was trying to be, I was wrestling with it. I wasn't being, you know, I was just like, this is where it's at. And he said, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Number one. Number two. It looks like if you're going to tithe, it's going to be by what? Faith. Ah. 
And he said, that's why God said in, as a principle in the Old Testament, you don't tie that, you don't lay out all your bills and see what's left over and say, okay, here's what I give. You tithe on the front end. In my studies in the Old Testament just this week, uh, I learned, uh, I was studying, looking into the, uh, into the uh, Jericho, the battle of Jericho. And that when God, that was the very first city that God put into the hands of the Israelites when they came into the promised land. It was Jericho. They defeated Jericho. And it's interesting that the command for God to the Israelites when they took Jericho, he said, level it, destroy it by fire and do not take anything. Jericho was a big city. There was a lot of, a lot of good stuff to be had. And as I was studying that and reading that, God just dropped it. That was, uh, I, I was watching an archaeology show on the city of, of the town of Jericho. And when they uncovered Jericho, the actual place of Jericho, they found a, a burned section. And then in that burn layer of the excavation, which holds back, goes back and, and substantiates this, the story of, in Joshua, they found a bunch of clay pots that, were, that had been burned, but inside the clay pots were they were all full of burnt grain. So it was in the springtime when this happened, which would have made sense that had, when they leveled it and, and they burned the place, that they, they had stored up a bunch of clay pots with grain and that grain had been cooked in it when it was set on fire and burned. And it reminded me that that was the grain offering. That God required of them. It was the first fruits. In other words, that first city, God said, leave it all. In other words, it belongs to God. It was a first fruits. They could have gone in there. No, God said, it's a first fruits offering. That's going to be for him. It was a tithe almost in a way. And I think of the faithfulness of, of this church and putting these principles into practice is between our missions, monthly missions that we send out to missionaries and between our uh, our benevolence, the opportunities we have to give to those in need, that comes out to at least 10%, if not more, of what we bring in every month. So even as a church family, as an organization, we are giving out and tithing in that sense of the, of the word, holding fast to the truth and the principles of God's word. When it comes to faith, it means, let me tell you what, a few years ago during COVID, when it was lean and things, and I'm like, I had those moments where, Lord... Should we still be, you know, we're spending $700 a month to go off to missionaries and that $700 a month could go for a lot of different things. And we still remain faithful and steadfast. And there were times that we, we gave to foreign missions and we did things out of faith, trusting that one, it wasn't just, oh God, I hope. No, it was a, the Lord said no, or in terms of continue to be faithful to that. And he gave opportunities. And that's what tithing often is. It is a statement of faith that God you gave me this to the begin with and now I'm going to offer back to you what you have been so blessed to give me but faith the kind of faith that Job had is means being and obeying God even when we don't understand it in Job chapter 7 verse 20 Job cried out have I sinned what have I done to you I mean See the bewilderment. He's not understanding at this time. Why have you set me as your target? Why then do you not pardon my transgressions? In chapter 27 of Job, he says, Job continued his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty who has embittered my soul, for as long, okay, I love this, for as long as life is in me, and the breath of God is in my nostrils. My lips certainly will not speak unjustly, nor will my tongue mutter deceit. Living the kind of life and the kind of faith that Job had means being faithful and content even in the midst of our doubts and our suffering. And I have found some of the greatest expressions and demonstrations of your faithfulness to God are not when you're shouting victories on the mountaintop. Thank God for the victories on the mountaintops. But the greatest demonstrations of the glory and the faithfulness and the goodness of God over your life is when you're shouting glory in the goodness of God when you're in the valley, when you're in the midst of the fiery furnace, when you're on the anvil and you're getting pounded. 
It's in those times that when you're, you yourself are having doubts, you yourself are wondering, why me? You yourself are like Job and thinking, what have I done, God? I'm beginning to wonder here. And the beauty of what we learned in the life of Job was he had his moments as well. There were times that he asked God, why? But in the midst of he held demonstrated faithful to, to what God had said, even in his not knowing he was faithful. He was obedient to God when he didn't understand. So he was faithful to God. We didn't see it. He's, and being faithful and walking in faith means obeying God when we don't understand it. Number three about the life in the, uh, of faith in Job. Walking by faith means persisting when we don't feel like it. Now, there's a big one right there. It means being persistent even when we don't feel like it. It means you wake up in the morning. At least a couple times throughout the week, I have the battle of the blankets. Anyone know what I'm talking about? It means technically I don't have to be at I don't have to get busy with something until, you know, maybe 8 o'clock. But I've set the alarm much earlier than that. And so the alarm goes off. And it goes off because I've planned to get up. I've planned to give and devote that time to the Lord. I've planned to, to pray. I've planned whatever it is. And, and something comes up. And it's my covers. And it's that battle. But walking by faith means being persistent when we don't feel like it. We are to walk by faith, not by feelings. Your feelings can deceive you. Your feelings will deceive you. We are to walk by faith. We are to walk under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit over our life, not our emotions or our feelings. It doesn't mean that feelings and emotions aren't important. It just means that they're not priority. And we see in the life reflected in Job here, we understand that faith means pers persisting when we don't feel like. In Job chapter 6 verse 10, But it is still my consolation, and I rejoice in unsparing pain. Did you just hear what Job said? I rejoice in unsparing pain pain when's the last time you hit your thumb with a hammer and you said hallelujah thank you for this pain <laughs> if you did you are walking in the footsteps of job he says and i rejoice in unsparing pain that i have not denied the words of the holy one Somehow in this, in job's faith in god was demonstrated that he, he was persistent even when his feelings didn't line up with it. He was persistent in this when his feelings didn't line up. He didn't feel like it. And when your feelings, and, we, and as the older we get, perhaps the more in tune, who knows about this, but when it comes to feelings, feelings are fleeting. Feelings come and go like the wind. Feelings can be deceiving when that becomes how we base and make our decisions. You ever gone to go buy a used car? You know it kind of how, how feelings can, you know, the, you come and you just want to look. No, they want to get you inside the car. They want to just sit in there. Just, you know, oh, you know what? What's your budget? No, you know, okay, whatever this. And then the next thing you know, they're going to, uh, they're going to, you know, what's better than a used car than perhaps a new car? And oh, yeah, this is on the lot. Just sit in there for a moment while I go find a used car for you. And, and so you're sitting in this new car and you smell the new leather, you, you know, new car smell and, and then they come out and they say, you know, let's just take it around the block. It's just here. We'll, we'll be back, this, that, and the other. And, and they want to invoke in you these feelings of, hey, this, you know, how's that feel? You know, like that? I feel nice. And it's real easy to get wrapped up in the moment. And then and rather than walking out with a used car with a budget that you were thinking about, you're in a brand new car with maybe, you know, twice of what you're planning on spending. But, oh, but now you can sit in your new car. Feelings. Oh, boy. But the walk of faith means we're persistent 
by faith, even when we don't feel like it. When it comes to feelings, I know that James chapter 5, verse 11, and this is going back to being persistent. James 5, 11 says, when we count those blessed who endured, we count those blessed who go through suffering. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. The endurance of Job. We talk about the patience of Job, but really what patience is, it's endurance. How many know what I'm talking about? Patience requires endurance. Patience requires endurance. It's one thing to be patient for the microwave to go off after a couple, two, three minutes. It's another thing this, that level endurance, holding fast, being steady through the suffering, through the ordeal. James 1.3 says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Your faith is going to be tested. Why? Because God wants to expand your faith. He wants to grow your character. And it's going to require suffering. It's going to require some type of trial. God sets these up not to tempt us, because God does not tempt anyone, but to test us in order to, to, to prove that what God knows is within us. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. There are times you've got to remind yourself sometimes every day of every hour of every moment, God, you're perfecting me. You must think a lot of me and he does. You're allowing this. I don't know the reasons. I don't know the whys. But God, you are allowing me. I rejoice in my suffering. That sounds so foreign to say. It may sound foreign to think about. But a person who walks in the kind of faith that Job walked in, you have to be persistent when you don't feel like it. And how do you, are you persistent? You got to be reminded of the greatness and the goodness and why God is who he is and what he says about the sufferings and the trials that we go through. And James says, knowing that the test of your faith produces endurance. And we need endurance in this life. Because without endurance, it means you're quick to respond. You're acting out of your emotions and your feelings. And they're going to they're gonna, uh, turn on you so fast. Anyone here have a story to tell of when you acted out of your feelings? And you responded out of your anger? You responded out of your... It's... And a tragic example of this is the nurse that you, uh, who was going through a bad breakup and driving 100 miles an hour a couple weeks ago, plowed through an intersection, killed a mother with an unborn baby, killed her child, killed the father, and killed a few other people, I believe. Going through a bad breakup. I don't know the ins and outs of why she was driving 100 miles an hour. Or 90 miles an hour. That's an extreme example. But it's not too far from the reality that. You need to get your emotions under. Under grip. You need to be. Focusing on living as Job did. That you are not responding out of the feelings. All the time. But you are responding out of faith in God. That your response to when you get hit with news, when you hit with adversity and challenges, is not immediately responding out of emotion and out of feelings, but you've got to go to God's Word. You've got to have that foundation planted. And let me tell you what, Job didn't all of a sudden, when he got hit with this, all this suffering and all this misery and all this loss, he didn't immediately start, you know what, I better start going to church. Man, i got to find that Bible somewhere and start memorizing some scripture. He was suffering. He didn't have no bandwidth for none of that. It was too late if that was the case. And how many times do I see that happen over and over and over again? People, I preach funerals here, there, and everywhere. And there's always times extended family. Oh, Pastor Matt, you know, oh, where, yeah, where's that church? I need to go there. You know, they're coming because they're mourning the loss of a loved one or whatever. And then they might come. They might come once. They might come twice. They might not come at all. Yet, when they get hit with adversity, pastor, pastor. Now, I'm thankful that I'm one that they called. I'm not in any way disparaging that. 
I'm hoping to be an opportunity to be a blessing and to serve and to help. But God did not put me on this earth nor any pastor in your life to be the one to answer all the questions for you. That there comes a time where God wants to strengthen you up. He wants to build you up. And when it comes to the sufferings and the turmoils that we go through, oftentimes it's not just for our benefit. It's for the benefit of others. One of the number one reasons that God, or ways that God has softened my character, has made me more like Him, is through the hardships, the sufferings, the trials, the tribulations. And sometimes the suffering, we look at the suffering of Job. It says at the very end, it says that, when it, that God replaced all that Job had lost. He actually doubled. He replaced his sons and his daughters. And he doubled all his resources. And the Bible says that he allowed Job to live another 140 years to enjoy that. And he lived to a ripe old age. And I'm thankful for God's blessings in that. But let's step back here in a moment. God can add to your family, but He can't replace. There was still suffering that Job had to go through. There were still the memories. There were still those times of those children that he had had. That through adversity, through the situation, that God in His sovereignty allowed, gave permission for the adversary to do what he did. And so God speaks up and he says he speaks through the whirlwind. And God manifested his presence and his power. And he blitzes Job with just 61 questions. And ultimately it places Job in a... In a, in a he understands that he spoke out of turn. That he, he flirted a little bit too much with questioning and the wise. Walking by faith means persisting when we don't feel like it. And the fourth dimension of faith that I believe we can learn from the life of Job is walking by faith means announcing God's truth before we have it. In Job 13, Job said, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Job has had a measure of faith. He walked in faith that even if it didn't work out the way he thought it would, even if it didn't make sense, even if he didn't understand it, even if he didn't see it, even if it feel like it, he says, though he slay me, I mean, that's as extreme as it gets. Though God slay me, I will hope in him. Even though I don't get my electric bill paid, even though I'm sitting in the dark, even though there's no gas and I get stranded on the side of the road, even when something tragic and horrible happens in my life, my faith is not dependent on the circumstances of the world around me. They are grounded in the truth and the character and the reality of who God is. And I have so many times that I have to remind myself that because the flesh forgets those things real fast. Because we get absorbed in our feelings. Why me? Poor me. Why now? Why this? And we begin to focus on what we don't have, on, our, on why, all these other things. And we must remind ourselves, walking by faith means announcing and declaring God's truth before we even see it. Before we can see it in the natural. By faith. That's what faith is. It is the substance of things hoped for. 11, Hebrews 11.1. 1. The evidence of things not seen. And the only way I know how to live out my life of faith in this area is that I must go to the Psalms. I must go to the scriptures that declare the greatness and the wonder of God. And I got to know that I can't run to God after I get hit with the tidal wave. Job wasn't scrambling to develop his character in his relationship to God. It would have been too late. It would have sunk him. He would have cursed God. It would have been over. Do not think. Well, I've got God in my back pocket. I can 
pull on, draw upon him when I need him. If that's your attitude towards God, if that's your attitude towards your relationship to him, that you're just close enough to go through the way, the, you know, some of the choppy waters now, you're going to, here's the truth, here's a reality check, it will get worse. Life has a way of getting harder. Establish your faith today. Put your trust in God today. For you to weather the kind of suffering that Job had, you need to have the kind of faith that Job had. And Job's faith was not just in the moment. It was something that had been laid down. It was foundational to him and who he was. We look all the way at the very beginning that it says that he was a righteous, blameless, upright man before God, that he feared God. It says that he would offer sacrifices on behalf of his children, even in times when they were out partying and having a good time. Well, maybe they'd sinned and he would offer prayers on their behalf. Job was a righteous man. He was a businessman. We know that he had uh, 3,000 camels. That's like a bunch of diesel trucks. I mean, he was in the transportation business. He was in all these things. He knew a lot of people. He'd done a lot of things. And it says he was blameless before man, that he was uh, a righteous man. And all these things were examples of how he had lived before his God. And when he got hit with this adversity, I mean, think about it, just for, uh, just for God to say, hey, check out Job. He's a righteous, blameless, upright man. Ain't no one like him. And all the things that God did and said to Job, there were a lot of questions. But ultimately, God did not verbalize any answers. Read it. Read the whole, everything God says. God does not verbalize any answers. What does God do though? God shows up. And when he shows up, Job replies, As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and, as, and at the last he will take his stand on the earth. Job's faith in God. When God responded, it says that Job said, okay, I'll be quiet. Job understood it was, it was the answer he wanted. In other words, he wanted to know that God was in charge. He wanted to know that God was there. He wanted to know that God was in heaven and his presence was enough. And it put Job at peace. He was content. He was content with experiencing the presence of God. And it brought him the peace that nothing on earth could have ever done. And I have found that in my own journeys, when it comes to being faced with adversity and crying out for God, it's His presence. It's His presence. So Job's faith was expanded through his suffering. And so will yours. And as your faith in God grows, so will your courage and your peace and your joy and your contentment. And so I'm going to close with the purpose of the trials that you may be going through right now in your life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, Peter says, this is your great, In this greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the, as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. 
God wants to expand and deepen your faith in him because it is by his grace through faith that you obtain the salvation of your soul. The salvation of your soul. If you've ever been a parent, you know there are times that kids want things and you realize some things are good for them and other things are not. And there are things that children want that aren't good for them. And when you say no, you're not going to have six donuts for breakfast. No, you're not going to, you know, you just feel there's things that kids want that we as parents know better. And when it comes to us and God, there are so many things, even as you know, we're adults, there's things that we want. There's things that and God says, no. I know better. Ugh! God says, I know better. We live in a generation, a world where the, the values of this world are, you know, quick, fast, and right now, and in the moment, and, and, the, and God say, no, you need to wait. Trust in the Lord. He doesn't say these things to punish us. He says them because he's producing and he uh, uh, faith, trusting in him, producing these things in our life. In this situation that you find yourself in, in the life of Job, I want you to be, I want you to rejoice in your suffering. I want you to be reminded that you have the faith of Job, even though you can't see it even though you can't understand it, even though you don't feel like it. And that you declare by faith, even though you haven't perceived it, you haven't obtained it. But that's what faith is. That don't wait to build your faith until you get into a crisis. That before then is, is, is the truth. Your relationship to God is not something to put off until next week to a better time. There is no better time. Today is the day of salvation. Today is these days that God has called us to walk in in our lives. So Heavenly Father, I speak over the house of God this morning. I pray over every saint that is listening to my voice. It said that Job repented before God, that the revelation of who he was, he realized he had spoken out of turn. He had spoken beyond his pay grade, that there were things in the questions of God that he realized, I'm sorry. And if there's any one of us here today that have been grumbled and complained and have spoken out of turn before God, that God, in the name of Jesus, that you would forgive us that we be humbly reminded that God your ways are so much higher than ours even though we don't understand it even if we may not see the upper story the big picture what's going on in the spiritual realms it does not change the realities that God you are God and you are good and you are powerful and you are involved and you are active in our lives and I thank you Lord for responding to Job and it wasn't just the answers it was just in your presence and God, teach us to trust you when we don't understand. We don't understand why our son's doing this and going there. We don't understand why our body's acting like this way or that way. We don't feel it. We doesn't understand. It doesn't make sense. But God, that we have the faith of Job. That yet though you slay me, yet though life goes the opposite direction that I'd ever thought imaginable, I will have my hope in God. 